Our scripture readings this morning are Psalm 8, verses 1 through 9, Galatians 3, verse 28, and Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Psalm 8, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You have put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Mm. Galatians 3:28. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Matthew 28 verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So friends, I want to first say thank you to your pastor, Reverend Kara, for inviting me to come and worship with you and to help in leading worship. We first met, I met Kara uh, when she was a college student and she was serving on the General Board of Church and Society where I was at the time, uh, the Assistant General Secretary, I was on staff and we got to know each other quite well. I was able then when she was in Divinity School to visit with her and other United Methodist students and by coincidence, we attended the same Divinity School. And so it was really great to see her in that space. Um, so I'm grateful, I'm grateful. I also was having a conversation with a former pastor of this congregation, uh, Reverend Deb. Um, Deb was reminding me about a ministry you all have with Tanzania. And I'm not sure who's involved or if you're involved. If, okay, right, okay, beautiful. Thank you for the ministry of Tanzania. I have great friends in Tanzania. I know missionaries there. And Deb and I were talking yesterday and she were catching up, she's now retired. Uh, but her memories of being in this congregation are deep and loving and fruitful, and she is so grateful for this congregation. So um, I bring greetings from Reverend Deb as well. So will you pray with me? Creator, this is your time and your space, and we enter into it knowing that you will give us what we need. We ask God, whether it's through song or prayer or through touch or through silence or through the word you may continue to be present to us and sustain us and take us to the space that we need to be. Help us to truly be part of your body and thank you God for the gift of your spirit. I offer this prayer in the name of Christ, amen, amen. Friends, several years ago, a teacher of mine made an analogy between the story of the risen Christ meeting the disciples on a mountain and are going to a theater. And this came to me just a couple of days ago. I hadn't thought about this image, but I wanna share it with you. Imagine that we have just, we're, we're going to a play, we're going to the theater. I love to go to the theater. That's one of my favorite things to do. 
and we've read the reviews, we're looking forward to this, this play, we've left our home, we have parked the car, we have made our way to our seats, and we wait for the play to start. Our, our seats are in different places. We're not all lined up. It's a theater that's organized in some unorthodox ways. Some of us are over to the right and the left. Some of us have a higher seat. Some of us are close up to the stage. But we're all watching the same play. We're all expectant. And uh, we, we, we come into the play. We watch the first scene, the second scene. We enjoy an intermission. We come back for the remainder of the play, and then we, we, we exit. And there are mixed emotions all through the evening. We empathize with some of the characters. We feel distant from others. We leave the play asking each other, what did you feel? How did you see that? And some say that, well, I was on the left side of the theater, and others say I was in the back seat, so my experience was a little bit different from yours. I missed the first half because I was dealing with a child back home who was ill, and I was waiting for the child care provider. Should I come to the play or not? And still another person was so close to the stage, they felt enveloped by the characters themselves, immersed in the plot and the story. Well, the gospel this week is sort of like that play. Last week, we celebrated Pentecost. Pentecost is like watching a play and coming away with different perspectives, even though we have heard the same story. Even though we've heard the same story, it's from different perspective. We've had different experiences. Last week, Pentecost, we heard the story of how the Spirit came upon the church. It empowered the church, the Jesus movement, in love languages that spoke best to each person. It was not an identical experience in any way. And so that's what happened last week. And so we carry that with us into today, Trinity Sunday or Peace with Justice Sunday, or the second Sunday after Pentecost, however you want to enter in. And we hear this gospel from Matthew. Matthew is building on that story of Pentecost. And we actually hear Jesus' last words spoken on earth. It came to me this week, my God, these are the last things that Jesus said, so I better pay attention to what he's saying. And these words form the mission statement for every church. It doesn't matter what kind of church, Catholic church, a Protestant church, an evangelical Pentecostal church, they form the, the mission statement for the church. Go into all the world and make disciples of all the people and baptize all of them and teach them all the things that I have taught you. Those are the last words. Christianity has been in India, my home country, for about 2,000 years. And I'm the child of parents who were educated in mission schools, whose great-great-grandparents chose to become Christian and they were baptized after a lifetime living in an entirely other faith. I would have loved to hear from my great-great-grandparents what it is that liberated them enough that they made a choice to believe and follow this Christ and then to join the Methodist Church. Back then it was the Methodist Church. What did it mean for them to turn away from all that had shaped them in what would have been and still is a dominant Hindu and Jain area and culture. And so today we hear Christ give a pretty inclusive commandment. Sometimes we focus on the go part. And if you're, you, that's what you want to do, then I invite you to do that. But I want to challenge you on that. It's part of Christ's words, but it's not all of what he says. Get moving. Yeah, that's part of it. Get out there and introduce people to who Jesus is. Yeah, that's part of it, yes. But you might be surprised to learn that go is not the main verb in the Great Commission. Making disciples is the imperative in the Great Commission. The going, the baptizing, the teaching, they're all elements of discipleship making. But making disciples is the primary task Christ gives to the church. Making disciples does not mean coercing people or forcing them into right belief. John Wesley, I think, had it right when he said, and I'm paraphrasing in contemporary language here, while I am fixed on my own principles and what I believe to be true about Jesus, 
And while I firmly adhere to that worship of God, which I just to be most acceptable in God's sight, and while I am connected with the most tender and closest ties to a particular congregation, he said, when my heart is enlarged toward all humankind, those who I know and those who I know not, he says, when I embrace with strong and cordial affection neighbors and strangers alike, friends and enemies alike, though we cannot think alike, may we not love alike? May we not be of one heart, though we are not of one opinion? Without a doubt, Wesley says, we may. Herein, all the children of God may unite, notwithstanding their smaller differences." Close quote. Making disciples is entirely the opposite of what we have come to call the doctrine of discovery that for 600 years drove the church's mission and framed the church's story. The doctrine of discovery was used to justify empire building, settler colonialism, occupation, enslavement. And I wanna remind us of this piece of our history because what I think Jesus is getting at is entirely different than what we've been experiencing for so much of our Christian history. In 1436, the nation of Portugal convinced Pope Eugenius IV to issue a papal bull granting exclusive control to the islands to civilize, and I'm giving you direct quotes, and to convert the Canary Islanders to the one true religion for the salvation of the souls of the pagans of the islands, baptize them in the name of Christ. In 1452, Pope Nicholas V authorized the Portuguese discoverers, quote unquote, to invade non-Christian lands and to capture, vanquish, and subdue all pagans and enemies of Christ, to reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, to take away all their possessions and property in the name of the Great Commission, close quote. In 1492, by authority of the Almighty God, Pope Alexander VI said, I grant to the monarchs of Spain and to their heirs forever until time eternity all the islands and mainlands found to be found and to still to be found discovered and to be discovered toward the west and the south from the arctic pole to the antarctic pole and we appoint you and your heirs lords of them all for full free power authority and jurisdiction of every kind and in 1529 in the treaty of zaragoza the countries that extended the line around the globe and divided up the Pacific Ocean, the islands applied to the doctrine of discovery to divide and conquer lands and peoples in Africa, across Asia, and all of the Americas. We are still dealing with the legal and theological legacy of the doctrine of discovery, which has been justified on those last words that Jesus spoke. In stark contrast, in stark contrast, the risen Jesus offers us something refreshingly simple. Go and make disciples. And over the years, that has been understood to mean wait and welcome converts because we want to extend the utmost hospitality to those we're waiting for. And we may pour ourselves out into the places where we wait. And often, if we're honest, these are climate-controlled spaces and comfortable spaces where we wait. But Christ never said, if you build it, they will come. And Christ never said, wait. Christ said, go into the world. The whole world. The whole world was an uncertain and insecure empire of the day. And as creation theologian Matthew Fox reminds us, taking in the whole world is a big thing. Matthew Fox says, our universe is made up of two trillion galaxies. While Matthew's great commission talks about teaching the commandments Jesus has taught, at the heart of these are love of God, love of neighbor, love of self, and vice versa. Matthew Fox says, our neighbor is not restricted to the two-legged ones, but all creation deserves to hear that humans are busy loving all creation, all creatures, not destroying other creatures and creation in narcissistic, narcissistic fits of 
greed and violence that end whole species while endangering human generations that follow with a depleted earth, close quote. Making disciples means engaging in God's creative work. This is what Jesus means when Jesus says, all authority is given in heaven and earth. It has been given to me. God the creator, Christ the redeemer, the one and the same God holds authority. And that is the center. That is the center. God holds all earthly authority. For me, that is a liberating message because it is not the media, it is not a political party, it is not even my citizenship that holds my authority. It is God who holds the authority of what is seen and unseen. And I think of heavenly and earthly authority. If it is key to the Great Commission's power, then it raises some questions for me. And I invite you to reflect on these questions today. Whom can I trust? Who will tell me the truth without spinning it out to get what they want or get something in return? Who will lead me in a way that is just and merciful at the same time? Who will have my best interests in heart? Who will stand for you when no one else will? Who will keep you safe from harm? Do you good? And who will love you when no one else will, or others say they will, but they don't show up? Whom can you trust? If we go back to the beginning of the passage, the Gospel of Matthew gives us a really important piece of information we may have missed as we hurried over familiar words on our way to the going and the making and the baptizing and the teaching of new disciples. And I invite you to look at it again. It's in verse 17. And Matthew tells us, when they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. After all that, they still doubted. Some doubted, maybe all doubted to some extent. And I love Matthew's honesty here. Worship and doubt are inextricably connected. The disciples were in awe. They chose to turn themselves over to someone and something greater than themselves. And at least some of them doubted. I love that it says they doubted. They weren't sure if they could trust the one they worshiped, but they worshiped and they doubted. Why do you think Matthew put that line in there? Maybe Matthew mentions the doubt to encourage us when our own trust is too small to live out the gospel, or maybe to live the great commandment to love God, neighbor, and self with all our heart, mind, soul, and spirit, even when we doubt. Maybe we aren't alone when it comes to doubt. Maybe when it comes to the wondering whom we can trust, even the closest followers of Jesus had these moments of doubt when they, weren't just, when they sure, just weren't sure. And I think about Matthew and reminding us that doubt is an integral part of faith. I think that was his point. The opposite of faith is not doubt or fear. Maybe the opposite of faith is, uncertain, is certainty. Maybe when we see certainty as something to hold on to, we don't really need faith. Maybe when we're sure in our own minds we don't really need to trust anyone else, we lack faith. Doubt makes us vulnerable to grace. Doubt opens us up to the possibility that there is someone we can trust. And trusting in the face of our doubt is what faith really means. Trusting in the fate of doubt is to take a risk to follow Jesus. And just as important as this, helping others to learn to trust Christ in the face of their own doubt, my friends. I think that is what it means to make disciples. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, some, for some of you, the name may be familiar. Uh, he wrote a book he's most famous for called Costly Discipleship. And this was during the Nazi Germany and period, period where with Christian nationalism on the rise. He said, my life as a Christian ought to make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I'll say it again. My life as a Christian, as a disciple, ought to make non-believers question their disbelief in God. I cannot see the Great Commission apart from the Great Commandment. Friends, the United Methodist Church's General Conference ended only a few weeks ago, two short weeks ago. 
and many of us seriously doubted we would accomplish anything of worth. After four long years of delay after delay after delay, and 50 years of tireless work to remove discriminatory harmful language on LGBTQI plus people and their relationships, all of that language was removed. All of that language was removed. And for so many delegates, these were the same delegates that came to General Conference 2019 and 2016. And you have to wonder, what happened to change? Change their opinion, change their mind, to cause them to worship God in a new way? What caused them to doubt their previous uh, convictions? And what caused them to live into faith and discipleship in a new and startling way? Some of us still doubt it. We doubt it. This is the first time, friends, in the history of the United Methodist Church that no single group has been singled out to be excluded from the invitation to live fully into what discipleship means. That alone is tremendous. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. What could easily be lost, though, are the other creative discipleship, discipleship making actions that passed at the General Conference. And I want to share these with you and sort of end this message with a call to action, uh, because these discipleship making actions communicate grace upon grace upon grace and an opportunity for us to respond, to go and to respond and to live out the message that Christ offered at that mountain. Alongside adopting a new set of social principles for the first time in over 50 years, what some have called a love letter to the church, delegates also passed establishing a conference caretakers of God's creation uh, coordinator position. So every annual conference is to have now a, a, a caretakers of God's creation team and a coordinator. They passed a resolution on use of plastics, commitment to net zero greenhouse gas emissions, protecting the right to peacefully address injustice. The Association of Ministers with Disabilities worked to pass these resolutions, ableism and audism. I'd never heard that term before, audism. Safer sanctuaries for vulnerable adults. How can our congregations truly be safe space for vulnerable adults? Disabilities and the ordination process so we don't exclude people because of their disabilities from following their call into the ordination process in the United Methodist Church. And I learned a new humbling term from one of my colleagues. I am temporarily able-bodied. We all are. Neil, you are temporarily able, but I love it. I'm still, I'm still grappling with what that means. From the Asian American Caucus, the caucus that I'm actually part of, a resolution addressing racial, ethnic discrimination and gender-based violence in the Asian American context passed overwhelmingly. Persecution of Christians and other minorities in India also passed with strong support. The Native American Caucus supported opposing names demeaning to Native Americans. Resolutions on the Trail of Tears, healing Native American trauma through the Religious Freedom Act, support for the Indian Child Welfare Act, education, health, and welfare also passed. Other caucuses advanced these proposals, these resolutions, the right to reproductive health care, mental health discrimination and disability compensation. The Hispanic Caucus, also known as Marcha, advocated for lifting the U.S. embargo on Cuba after decades of, of secluding this country addressing the impact of military testing in Vieques, Puerto Rico. The Western jurisdiction passed a, a remarkable resolution called Apology for the Illegal Overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom and the Hawaii Act of Repentance. UN Kairos re response, which focuses on Palestine and solidarity with our Palestinian siblings and peace with justice in Israel and Palestine, addressed Israeli detention of children and fossil free United Methodists, while they did not pass a, a divestment from fossil fuels with our United Methodist pensions and investments, they did promote 10 reasons why United Methodists should divest from fossil fuels. And I have hope we will move forward with that resolution in 20, uh, 2028. We also passed resolutions on worldwide regionalization that would give the United Methodist Church time to work together in unity 
and the freedom to develop contextual ministry given our different histories, cultures, and challenges. These are only a, sex, a small segment of the resolutions that pass that have to do with peace and justice, human dignity, and human rights. And if even one of them, friends, even one of them calls out to you, I invite you to learn more and to explore how you can be involved in discipleship making through these resolutions and the acts of the General Conference. How will they help liberate our imagination to go deeper with discipleship? Will they cause us to go and tell and to live out the great commandment? What do these and many other resolutions have in common? They are expressions of what I call, what I believe the gospel is calling us to do, which is to encourage us even in the midst of our doubt. Even in the midst of our doubt. They admit that we have different love languages that we practice because of the Pentecost spirit. And we will move differently in this universe. But just as going, baptizing, and teaching are all elements of discipleship making, these actions taken by the General Conference now need to be owned by every congregation of the United Methodist Church. And I believe they will help us make disciples who are committed to the Great Commission, the Great Commandment to love God, neighbor, and self. And so I come back to a quote, and I'll end here, by one of my favorite authors, Robin Myers, and it's a book called Underground Church, reclaiming the subversive way of Jesus. And so I invite you to reflect on this with me. What she says is this, one of our highest and most sacred obligations is to look for the good that is not yet there until we see it. The church is a place where we make one another into what we expect from one another. When radically embodied trust replaces intellectual assent or agreement to theological propositions, we create people who possess and practice radical trust in God and one another. May it be so, may it be so, amen. So we have come to the mountain. We are now sent out to go, to be baptized into a new world, not the way the world was, but the way the world can be, and to tell and to receive. And so as we do this, may those for whom love is a stranger find in all of us kind and generous friends. Let us go in peace. Amen. NBUMC Weekly is a production of North Bethesda United Methodist Church located in Bethesda, Maryland. Follow us on YouTube and Facebook at North Bethesda UMC or on Instagram at Loving All Neighbors. All music is licensed via Christian Copyright Licensing International, CCLI.